Welcome to Good Things Happening, the show that explores the sustainability progress that's being made just under the surface at your favorite brand or company. I'm your host, Derek Sabori, and these are the people making it happen. All right, Mackenzie, we're back. Welcome to our weekly show. You and I are getting together here again. Nice to see you. Um, I feel like we it's been a week since we've been together on the podcast. Yeah, and it feels like it's been longer to me. I feel like it's it's been ages since we've done a weekly recap. Well, it's fun because we've been getting out these episodes where we're doing interviews with our experts. That was always the plan. So we've released a couple. We've got a handful in the in the editing studio right now as I'm going through them. But so far, we've been able to get out a um, an interview with Pangea Seed, with the Pangea Seed Foundation, Trey and Akira, the co-founders there, doing their Seawalls campaign. We released the episode with Teresa McKinney at Nemo. She's the sustainability director. And you recently just got to go through the edit, as we do them together, of Ryan Black, the CEO of Sambazon. What are you and I had a conversation yesterday that I really appreciated. What do you... What are your takeaways from this? What do you what do you think people will get out of these interviews as we kind of slowly release them? There's some great stories though and insights in there, right? What do you what are you appreciating as you as you listen to these? Well, they're just so exciting hearing everyone talk about the passion that's in their voice for their organizations. Um and they're across all these different sectors. You know, we have nonprofits, then we have Teresa who's in textiles um in the outdoor industry specifically. And then Ryan Black in the food industry. And then even breaking those down even further, we have, again, nonprofit. We have a for-profit organization. And then we also have a social purpose corporation. So seeing how Mm. all of these are coming together, and even though they're so different from each other, they're all kind of touching on the same sustainability topics. So it's just opening up this entire rainbow of what sustainability can be and what it is. And it's so exciting for someone in in my current state in life. You know, I'm 25 years old and still trying to figure out the whole career path thing. So for me personally, um, being selfish, these are just such great learning tools and just helping kind of figure it all out. What's the common thread that you're seeing run through them as you listen to these Was there a a common takeaway that you're in that position that you just mentioned as a young person building their career? What is there a common thread that you're picking up on or whether it's advice or insight that you're, that you're getting? I think the main thing that I've picked up on between all three interviews and all three organizations is that it's, it's not your career path is not a linear path. So it's not, I don't think anybody that we've interviewed really went into school or or had that mindset in high school, went into college with this, I'm going to be a sustainability professional. I'm going to solve all the world's problems and make a great product or do something really cool in the world. I think what I'm figuring out, what I'm seeing in these interviews is everyone's kind of putting it together as they go and um, collaboration as well, you know, mm. through mentorships and other people that just keep sparking that fire, driving that passion. Um, And so that's really cool to see that it's not just, you don't necessarily have to go to school for a sustainability related topic. You know, I didn't go to school for anything related to sustainability, really, for I went to school for communications. So seeing that it's like it can all be put together and lead you down a really meaningful career is very inspirational for sure. Yeah, I'm glad that you said that because each of these interviews that we've got, we've got uh, Brianna Kilcullen, who is the founder of Enact, a great towel company making towels out of hemp. She's got a fascinating career story. Wait till you hear that one. Um, what Alex Schultz, he's the CEO of uh, Four Ocean, this big ocean cleanup company. Now he knew he wanted to do something. He studied. He's one of the rare ones that actually did study entrepreneurial, you know, endeavors and business, and that's what he ended up doing. But you're right, most of us take this winding path. And I can, uh, you know, speaking as somebody who is well beyond you in their career journey, um, <laughs> it is, it's a path. And there's like these stepping stones that you take. And absolutely, I do think this is what I always try to tell people that, and I think you're re- realizing this as well, that it's so important to just learn about sustainability, because so few of us 
get that through our academic or career pathways, learn about it and apply it to whatever role you want. And if you go on to be the founder or get a sustainability director role, no problem, but we all need to be contributing to this this goal of doing things better, being more responsible, conserving resources, making a better future for future generations, kind of protecting that future for you guys. Whatever role you're in, you play a role. That's what we always say. So I'm glad you're getting all that and I'm excited to continue to roll these all out. So everybody stay tuned for next week. Ryan Black will be um, live, not live, but we'll release his episode. And it's a really exciting one because they've been a purpose-driven company focusing on fair trade and traceable supply chains for 23 years now. So there's also something to be said about persistence and keeping at it and doing it. We've got uh, Jonathan Hanwitt. He's the CEO of a strategy and communications company that does a lot of ESG work, uh, reporting with a lot of big companies. Um, um, his company is called Think Parallax. So that's going to be a great one as well. But uh, I am, I'm really excited to just share those. Speaking, though, of guests on the show, we've put out a handful of other invites, too. So we're waiting for one, particularly my good friend, John Stokes at New Balance. But I bring that up because he and the team there, they just released a sustainability report. And that was one of the things we wanted to talk about today because, Mackenzie, as we were looking at their sustainability report, it's so good. 55 pages of really great material in there. We started to have this conversation of, who are these reports for? Who reads them? We know the answer to that, but are is the average person, customers, are they seeing them? What are they getting from? There's so much work that goes into these. So you put together a few of them for us, but give me give me your thoughts as that y- younger person too. Do you read sustainability reports? Do any of your friends have you ever heard it come up in conversations? How important are they? Do you think to the to the general public? Well, I think I will say for myself, now being in the position that I'm in and knowing what I know about sustainability, I definitely read sustainability reports when they come out. And also, again, going back to the communications background, I'm a huge nerd for good data and breakdowns of that data. So I get really excited when I see a new sustainability report coming out. But I will say, I think majority of the public and consumers probably are not reading these reports because like you said, I mean, New Balances is 55 pages. I know other brands, there's for anybody who's familiar with Reckit, I believe they're a European group specializing in home care. Theirs is like 110 pages long. So I I think the average, uh, I read something that the average um, report is 138 pages. So these are not for the faint of heart. They're right. rich. And these are for typically for investors for especially now to because investors want to know what type of risk this, you know, companies their their investment might be exposed to. So investors, stakeholders, employees, suppliers that want to come on board, etc. So these are kind of business forms. But I think brands are trying to find a way to communicate and make them digestible for consumers. But the problem is sustainability as we know it, it's super complex and there isn't just one thing to focus on. There are all of these different things that have to be addressed. A sustainability report is usually broken into environmental, social, and governance or even people, planet, profit, essentially. Mm -hmm. So they're going through environmental sectors. What are we doing for social? And what are we doing for governance and the well-being of the company itself and, and making sure that we're sticking to all of these goals Goals and targets are in there, message from the from leadership. But each area, right, as we know, as we build out our course and talk to people, when you're looking at environment, for example, there are so many different things in there. What do we mean by focusing on the environment? Well, we mean climate, we mean deforestation, land use, soil health, uh, biodiversity, ecosystem services, et cetera. So you just continue to go down water use, waste, you, you name it. And then on the social side, same thing, worker well-being, wages, discrimination, harassment, overtime, traceability, all of that. So you can't help but just kind of see these things expand. But what are some um, sustainability reports? Let's pull up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up the, a couple of these reports here, and I think it'll be fun. We'll just kind of walk through them and have a look at what's on the, uh, what's on the table here, because... There's some good there's some good stuff here. So yeah, we'll pull these up. And if, for example, we look at the New Balance report, 
this is their 2022 report. And I know these guys, New Balance hasn't done a report in like 10 years. So this was a big endeavor for them. They start off with a message from the CEO, but this is a good opportunity to let people know what they've been up to for the last few years. And they broke it down into just that way, people, environment, and then for them, it's product, and then government and ethics. And then this is their SASB index, which we'll go through. Mackenzie, what, I guess, how does this compare to maybe, because you brought, we brought up some other reports to have a look at as well. What stood out to you, though, in the New Balance report? I know you kind of took a, a dive into it, how to, how to read through it. What um, what resonated with you when you looked through this? I think they did a really great job. And the whole team at New Balance, I know this is not a one-person effort. I, I think there was probably, I know we've talked to John, there's at least a few people who helped contribute to the report. So they did a really great job of collecting a lot of data and Again, those numbers are so important for tracking progress and transparency. So the average consumer may not know if they see a product has a footprint, an emissions footprint that says, let's just say six kilograms of CO2E, that's uh, carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. They may not know whether that's good or bad, Mm. but putting the numbers in here at least provides transparency so that the consumer can see this is the total footprint. And if they want to do the research to learn more, they can, but they don't have to. Yeah, it sort of gives some insights into, hey, if you're curious, if you're curious, we've got all this information. If we run through this to that point, you know, here are all of New Balances, for example, their goals and targets. And so a couple of things. If you look at here, for example, this is BSR, um, great organization, really helping, you know, further sustainability, responsible businesses. Um, practices, et cetera. They've got these 10 principles for good reporting. So I want to step back for a minute before we dive in any further and say, well, what makes a good sustainability report? So what they're saying is that number one, we've got to make sure that there's materiality and conciseness. So that means that we need to make sure that the company is addressing what are the most material impacts of the business, what affects stakeholders, what things stakeholders, what effects stakeholders have on the company. But typically that is going to be you know, the community, your suppliers, you know, the environment it could be forests, it could be the oceans, every, you know, kind of uh, every business has a different supply chain where there are things that are, hey, these are material um, impacts for us. For example, I don't know if uh, I'm thinking of, let's say like uh, Deserto, I don't know why this popped in my head, but they are the company that makes the cactus leather. Typically, they, if they're reporting on ocean health, that may not be a right fit, right? Because that's not a mater- they don't have a material impact on the ocean. This this might be a weird one, but I'm trying to illustrate a, 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 to- a concept here. Their focus should be probably on growing cactus, how it's processed, biodiversity, ecosystem services impacts, um, land use, uh, worker well being, etc. Things that immediately are, are tied to that business. So you want to make sure you're tackling the right things that it's strategic and forward looking. Um, Just like, you know, similar to financial reporting, they say that it should provide both a snapshot and an indication of what to look forward um, to in the future. You've got sustainability context and sustainability is environmental and social. You're using the right things. It's in line with, let's say they pointed out with the sustainable development goals, which New Balance does. They've identified um, an alignment with the uh, SDGs. You're using um, KPI, so you've got your key performance indicators, you've built a narrative, and it's it's complete and it's thorough. That is your content. So that's uh, what they say should be in it. When it comes to the quality, there needs to be stakeholder engagement. So it's from multiple voices, you're getting multiple perspectives, you're, you're having a thorough representation. It's balanced, it's finding a balance between successes, challenges, and shortcomings, they say, which I think is great. You've got assurance, there's consistency and comparability and connectivity of information. And this comparability is interesting because what that is saying is that, and I'll pull up another um, interesting report here. Actually, this is an article from Harvard Business Review, designing your company's sustainability report. But one of the things you can find is these frameworks. So every report as well, if we look back on that new balance one, they were talking about having a um, the SASB index, if you remember looking at that on their table of context. That was the last thing. You can search their all of their data 
by this index that keeps it in line with a particular framework so that we can compare apples to apples, for example. But the hard part is you've got all these different frameworks to, to play with. You can report according to the Carbon Disclosure Project, the Climate Disclosure Standards Board. GRI has sort of been one of the longstanding, most you know, popular ones, the Global Reporting Initiative. Now we have the International Integrated Reporting Council, SASB. That's the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. That's what New Balance aligned with. You've also got the Task Force on Climate-Related Disclosures, TCFD. World Economic Forum of International Business Council. And even um, there's another one that uh, recently came across my my, uh, board here. What is the CSRD? That is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive that will expand in the EU. So this is becoming mandatory, but there are a lot of different frameworks. You have to kind of stick by the guidelines. Mackenzie, does that make things more complicated or better or worse? Um, You can get a sense then, I guess, of how critical these reports are, right? Right. And it does make things more complicated. However, it is so necessary that that complication is so necessary to understanding sustainability and actually driving change. Um, We're past the point where we can just say, well, we're using recycled materials and we don't have any claims to back it up, but just trust us. It's we're, we're way beyond that. It's 2023. And Derek, like you said, it is becoming law now, especially in Europe, where you do have to report these things and there has to be hard data that backs it up. Um, So I think it's a really interesting time with just looking at reporting specifically in the sustainability space. People need to get comfortable with the language and that's why education is so important. So if you're a brand listening, for sure, you've got to have this on your radar. You've got to get your game together and be ready to report And uh, the reports of today are not like the reports of yesterday. Typically, they're going to be way more than just a PFD. And you're going to find reports from the biggest companies in the world, for sure. And those are going to be some of the most robust reports. They're going to be interactive. um, They're trying to find ways to make them engaging. But I would, if if there's a brand that you like and appreciate, I would spend some time looking through them, reading through them, and seeing what's in there. So we'll take a minute here and let's scroll back because we brought up three. We're going to look at Reformation's um, current sustainability report. We'll take a quick look at New Balances. Levi's got one from 2021. And it'll give you all kind of a sense of the different approaches that companies and organizations take. Board Riders did one a few um, last year or the year before as well. We can look at theirs. Theirs is a little bit different, but you can see the different levels of sophistication, I think, in terms of reporting. So let's start real quick by having a look at the board writers one, because that was um, their 2020 and 2021 report, 37 pages long. They put it into a PDF form. There was a landing page on the website that you could go to. But theirs was, they called it, you know, an ESG or CSR report, ESG being environmental, social, and governance, CSR being corporate social responsibility. Some might just call it a sustainability report. They have their table of contents here. They broke it down. So what they're doing is using this as an opportunity to tell us about the company a bit, talk to us about their brands who are in their portfolio, their purpose, their mission and values, their pillars, and then really kind of really outlining the things that they are focused on, what they're doing. But they tackled protection, education, community, human rights. They've got a foundation as well that they donate uh, money to organize to different organizations and their governance, how they're keeping all of this tied in and intact. And I think this is an important part, right? For them, they're saying that they have an advisory board, they've got a global team, they've got sustainability focused teams, vendor traceability. So this is a nice way for them to say, hey, showing the average customer that we're not just, like you said, saying, trust us, we've got a system in place to try to keep all of this um, all of this in order. They show all the different um, organizations and partners they've got. I think it's good. It's a bit of storytelling And a bit of metrics, there are not, I think in theirs, if I can remember correctly, I think they've got um, an opportunity to tell us how well they're doing against goals. I can't remember if they just announced goals or said what they were, how they have progressed. So here are their goals by the end of 2024. We probably will have to kind of revisit to see how they're doing on those goals. But um, a lot of companies you'll you'll see in these other reports, hey, and there just so (laughs) happens we got to plug in there as well. Um, and it's nice too because we got to plug in the New Balance one, uh, which was really exciting as well. 
but here's what they're this this was an opportunity for them to say hey for each of our brands you know 80 percent of our trunks are made from recycled materials etc so it's a good report i think it was one of their i think it's their first so it's a great starting point talk about all the certifications great opportunity to just say hey we're moving in the right direction we're doing some good things um, I think there could probably be some some stronger metrics in here, but I would imagine that will continue to go to grow. They wanted to basically tell people by the end of 2023, by the end of 2024, by the end of 2023, here's what we're doing. Here's what our commitments are. Um, right. But they also aligned with the SDGs as well, but it created a framework for them, right? You think um, this was pretty good. What you take away from this one? I thought it was really well done too, especially you're right. This was their first one. And I think that's kind of a note to consumers as well is maybe if you look at this report and compare it to some of the other very comprehensive reports like Patagonia's, for example, you're going to see some differences for sure. And I think take it with a grain of salt where if you're seeing, oh, well, you know, let's just say, for example, if Board Riders doesn't report on one thing, but Patagonia does, be patient with them. Writing sustainability reports takes a lot of time, a lot of um, human power, a lot of commitment from the team, and requires a lot of data that each and every brand may not have readily available, depending on how mature their sustainability department and program is. And also budgets are different. So some brands may not be as big as other brands, which means their sustainability budget is not as big, which means they can't spend as much money with different organizations collecting data and so on and so forth. So take it with a grain of salt. That doesn't mean don't be, don't have a critical eye. It just means this isn't greenwashing. What what Board Writers is doing is not greenwashing. What another brand may be doing, if the data seems slim, it's not necessarily greenwashing. It may just be the best available data that they have. And you've got to start somewhere. So that's a great point. And what this does too, is it it creates a framework for the organization going forward. It puts these together, it formalizes their commitments, structures their approach and strategy, gets everybody on the same page going forward. So agree, great start. If we go back to the New Balance one, uh, for example, let's go back here and see after their message. So if we poke around there, so here, for example, if we go, um, we've got the same thing about the company, about their leadership strategy. They're, now here, they're talking about their targets. We were just talking about this. So they are very clearly saying, hey, we've they've got a more mature program, right? So they had previous targets. They're telling us whether they are on target, whether they've achieved it. In some cases, too, they're saying, hey, we're only 11% there. This is a 2025 goal, but they're not shy to say, yeah, we're not, we're close or it's unverified. But you can go through everything from supply chain, human rights, climate emissions, water. And these are, they're dealing, for example, this is a mature program over at New Balance. They're dealing with scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. They're, you know, they they actually had an increase in emissions when they were trying to reduce their emissions by 50%. They've got a little um, footnote here to explain why that was, but it's great. This is very thorough, very detailed. This is a bit different than the board writers report. If we go back up here as well to their index, you can see another thing. You can go into specific topics. If we wanted to go people or climate, I want to go to climate here. Here are their, how they're going to have that meaningful change. They're different areas, energy efficiency, materials, longevity, this is really important advocacy, which a lot of brands are not at that point where they're working to change policy and, and affect that. But that's a big part of fighting climate change. They've aligned with the SDGs and they're telling us how their progress is. So really clean, really meaningful. But again, you're going to have to take some time reading through these. I'm sure there are ways and I would love to see brands getting creative on how to package this up and do some really unique storytelling with this to make this digestible digestible, interesting, and um, enticing to read. Mackenzie, one thing that I always remember, and I think I told this story um, in one of our cohorts recently, is I remember when I started my journey in doing this school of understanding, I was so intrigued with reading reports like this or um, reading industry snapshots, et cetera. As I was going through, and if you're listening, you might do the same, where you might've been reading and saying one and a half degree Celsius roadmap. You're like, what is that? What? 
what does that mean? And what I would do, you know, CDP, what is CDP? What is the UN Global Compact? Uh, what are, what, who is WRI? What are scope one, scope two, three emissions, et cetera? You can go through here. And as you're reading, if you're not familiar with this language, you're going to get stuck going, oh, wait, what is this? Why does that matter? And what I used to do is I would take that term and I would stop and I would copy paste. I would go over there. Then I would spend 20 minutes, 30, 40 minutes studying that. And then I would have my context and then I would come back. Point is, learning is so important because well, I'm a broken record with this, but most of us didn't get this knowledge or information coming through our academic or, or professional pathways. Mackenzie, how do you think, you know, you've been with me for a few years now, how I'm sure things have changed, right? You look at these reports a lot differently, I would imagine, than you would have two years ago. Is that right? Just coming out of school. Absolutely. And I think now knowing what I know, and Derek, you're absolutely right about, um, if you see a word or a phrase or even an acronym that doesn't look familiar to you and you're like, I have absolutely no idea what that is, learn about it, do a Google search, figure it out, or find different resources that talk about it. And even creating like a key terms list. I know you and I both have documents that have an explanation of different organizations and key terms and all the stuff that gets so complicated when you're first looking at it. But if you just break it up into little pieces and start to learn about it, it becomes easier. It, the journey becomes easier for sure. It definitely does. Let's have a look then real quickly before we wrap here with our final kind of thoughts on this. Let's take a look over here at the Levi's one because Levi's is another brand that we've talked about a lot. They've, they're have they only up to their 2021 report. So your reporter is always going to look back and report on the previous year or years or time period. But theirs is more of an interactive website kind of approach where they've got, hey, here's our, our strategy. You've got your leadership, a letter from your leadership, your sustainability strategy, what you're tackling. They put governance first. Governance for them is sustainability governance, data and privacy, economic contri contributions, ethics and integrity, product quality, responsible and inclusive marketing. Very robust here. For climate, they're talking about climate action, water stewardship, and biodiversity. Consumption, they're talking about the circular economy, sustainable fibers, safer chemicals, toward zero waste, that initiative, community, and then reporting. And for them, here's those ESG reporting indices as well and their data tables, and their ESG topics index. This is really interesting too. I'm going to take a minute here because this is why those indices or those frameworks are so important because you can locate where we discuss relevant ESG topics. So if you're an investor or a stakeholder with a, an interest in a particular topic, you know where to find it. So if you're looking for something in the environment, you can go there. And uh, what's interesting is that link doesn't seem to work or, or doesn't do anything or I'm doing something wrong. For example, I wanted to bring this up as well because this is the GRI sustainability um, index. And for example, GRI is one of the frameworks that companies will use, but you can see how many different things they need to that you should disclose. And they give them a code. So you have your foundational things to report on. If you're in a certain sector, you have certain materiality issues to, to address, whether you're in oil and gas, coal, agriculture, et cetera. There's an apparel specific one for sure. I know there is. And then they go into, you know, economic performance, your market presence, et cetera. Once you get down here to their th um, section three, GRI three, or the 301, 302, et cetera, you're looking at materials, energy, water and effluents, biodiversity, emissions, effluent and waste, waste. But each one of these, you know, kind of expands and has a whole bunch of information. So they walk you through what we want you to cover, waste generated, waste diverted, um, waste directed to disposal, process flow. You've got all of these terms that they go through. So they explain to you how we want you to report, what you want, we want you to report on, and where we should report. And that gets us back to those are the things that make a really strong and good report. So Levi's is making that attempt here. You can um, click on here and get their report summary. So here it is in that PDF. So they've got a nice 12 page summary that says, hey, we're focusing on climate consumption and community, a letter from the, the, the uh, from leadership from Chip Wilson. So essentially, you know, reports follow this same sort of layout. 
Here's the report from Reformation. This is their 2022 year in review. Same thing, a letter from us. They are giving themselves a scorecard and they are breaking theirs down into, you know, they've got a letter from leadership or from the company. That they've got a great, they've got a scorecard, which we can look at, but they're talking about circularity, climate positive, social responsibility, more good stuff. They're taking a more uh, playful approach, 34 pages. It is, you know, obviously not 138, a little less than the 55, but this is nice. This stays in line with their brand, with their look and feel. But I like how they've done this, right? Where they're saying, hey, um, these are setting new standards. We're being best in class in these areas. Here's where we, we're doing better and we're taking some leadership. Here's where we're just kind of doing good, it looks like. So this is great. I think some internal assessments are good and that's a good thing to do. But these are also opportunities to educate your consumer, show them what you're working on. It works internally and externally. Also, Mackenzie, another reason that these are important can I challenge you with that? I'm going to challenge you with this. Why else, who else reads these reports or who who are these reports interesting to? We talked about employers internally. We talked about investors. There's one other group that really relies on these public facing reports. What comes to mind to me first is the NGOs and nonprofits like the Fashion Revolutions, um, who's another one? I, Fashion Revolution, the Transparency Index is the one that always just sticks out right in my mind. That's right. Them, Stand Earth, anybody who Thank is you. Greenpeace will do the same. Yep. So you are absolutely right. So if this was a game show, the bells would go off. That's the <laughs> point. So this is this because a lot of those um, reports will rate and grade companies based on what they can find. So companies might get scores, let's say the Fashion Transparency Index, you're going to get scored on basically what they can find. Far as I know, in the past, they would comb through public data, public of what's available on your website, what they can find, and then try to reach out to you. But they, they don't have a direct contact from everybody. So you may or may not get a chance to reply, or it may go off your window. They're going to say, hey, we're doing our annual survey, reply to these questions here by this date. If a company misses those, and they can't clarify something, and they didn't have a good report that shows what the work that they're doing they may get a lower score or a lower assessment than maybe they deserve. So yes, sustainability reports are important. So they're good for your company. If you're a brand, they're good for employees to know about. This is a multi-stakeholder approach. So this is just a little talk to urge companies and brands to take a sustainability report seriously if you're not already doing one. Two, if you already are, Reformation, New Balance, Levi's, Get this out to your customers. Try to get them engaged. Give them some education and tools. Even if you have to spread it out over a short amount of time, try to draw readers in because we need consumers reading these and understanding them. NGOs, keep that pressure up because it helps brands kind of you know get to that next level and do things better and it drives us all forward. So Mackenzie, that's kind of what I'm thinking today. We'll just try to keep this here so that people can go spend some time exploring these websites, exploring sustainability reports, Ask your favorite brand if they have one. Go poke around on their website to see what kind of information they're sharing with you. Learn about the different frameworks. But as we always say, just keep learning. Get better in this space. So that's what I think, Mackenzie. Anything else to add to this before we jump? Nothing else to add. Just want to let people know that all the links to the reports will be down below in the show notes. Um, and if you are interested in any of the four brands or groups that we mentioned, Definitely play around on the websites, check out their sustainability pages, not just the reports, but explore the sustainability pages and resources that they have available to you. And then be sure to tune in next week for our conversation with Ryan Black, CEO at Sambazon. It's a great one. You guys are going to love it. So that's it, Mackenzie. I'll talk to you on the next one. Thanks so much for putting these together. And that's all you guys. Brands, make sure people, your employees understand your sustainability reports because our bet is that chances are they don't, or at least they don't understand them as well as they could. And if your employees don't, if they're not armed with the information they need to really drive towards those goals, you're not going to get there as fast as you could. So arm your employees with education. That's what we do. Put them through the school of understanding. That's what New Balance is doing. That's what board writers did. So we're here for you. Give us a call. Soft little sales pitch. We'll see you guys on the next episode. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hey, thanks for listening. This is a show produced by The Underswell and our School of Understanding. If you're interested in being a part of this movement and want to dive deeper into the art of understanding sustainability better so that you can do things better, be sure to visit us at theunderswell.com. We offer structured, easy to follow workshops, courses, and member resources to make sustainability a part of your career or lifestyle. Because remember, no matter what role you play, you play a role. And we're here for you. Thanks again.